Welcome into episode 309 of the Sources Say Podcast, your go-to Kentucky basketball and recruiting podcast on the growing KSR Podcast Network. Who, Sean, this this is going to be a rough one. We we gotta we gotta talk through this. We have to get our true, honest opinions off our chest uh, and, and talk about what the heck happened in Columbia. Um, Sean Smith of Go Blue Blue Country. Uh, joining us once again, Sean. Uh, I, I wish I I, w- I would ask you how the heck you are doing, but I think I know. Yeah, this is uh, day three of the flu, so starting to feel better enough to where I can come on here and talk. Um, I know we talked about like possibly doing something after the game. I was like, I, I can't. <laughs> I gotta go to sleep. So, and that game put me to bed last night. I didn't go to. I went to bed in a good mood because we won at Douglas. But I just didn't like the things that I saw last night in Columbia. I thought there was a a lot of worst moments just put all into one big game. And, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of things to be concerned about. But there's there's going to have to be some change moving forward. And when you lose like that, you're justified in making some changes. So I think for the first time, and again, 79-62 loss to South Carolina back-to-back. Um, Lamont Paris, I don't know what he's got going, cooking down there in in Columbia, but uh, the recipe is working against the Cats right now. Back-to-back wins to open his tenure uh, down at South Carolina. But, Sean, I think for the first time, I feel deflated after a Kentucky loss. Like, when we left that Kansas game, we said, well, yeah, it sucks and we don't do moral victories around here, but... You could see the vision. You saw them compete against a legitimate contender. You knew that they were, you know, new, neutral site. It kind of felt like that March Madness type setting. You you could see the vision there. So you were like, eh, it sucks that we lost, but whatever. UNC Wilmington, we came on this show and said, does it suck? Do, do we accept losses like this at Kentucky? No, we don't. But you're without DJ Wagner. You're trying to incorporate Aaron Bradshaw for the first time. The really the first time since Toronto, since these guys arrived on campus, that they were trying something different with their identity, where you have to incorporate a seven footer after going small ball and basically all in on offense and no focus on front court help. Basically, up to that point, we've never seen that. So you kind of expected some of those early adversities and the selfishness, the, you know, that had team had been a historically unselfish team assist to turnover ratio out the wazoo. The first, it was their first chance of, of looking like, okay, well, we kind of got our little me first ball out of the way. Now we know what that looks like. Let's never do that again. Cal kept throwing that stat out 40 straight, 40 possessions of zero or one pass, uh, in in that game, you kind of saw that, okay, this is what we can't do ever again. Then Texas A&M, it was kind of the same thing from a offense versus defense perspective where we said, okay, this team right now thinks we could just go out there and beat the hell out of anybody by scoring 150 points. Who cares about defense? We don't have to stay locked in. We don't have to maintain that that culture and identity on that end of the floor. So it sucked to lose the way they did in Columbia in in College Station, knowing how close that one was. But again, you could kind of just say, "Well, how often? How often are you going to score ninety points in a game and lose?" Oh well. And then you got the end of game issues against Mississippi State and then Georgia, and we just kind of said, "Well, look at the offense." But ooh, it's starting to we're starting to see bad habits here. I hope it doesn't bite you in the butt. And then here we are. For the first time, there's really not one tangible thing you can hang on to after that game in Columbia where you say, ah, you know what? Move on to the next one. This this was the first concerning loss, I think, of the season where I really don't know what next looks like. And I think it's going to be a tough couple of days for that team in practice to try to figure out what that really looks like. Yeah, this... This is definitely the first time that I think that they return home and they have to kind of look at themselves. It's it's not been that point. Like even after A and M, we could talk about it was lack of rebounding. It was lack of toughness. Last night was a lack of a lot, and lack of toughness is hurting this team. Physicality. Now, a lot of people wanted to blame officials and things. Was the opening segment of the game good last night? No, it wasn't. But you got to be able to overcome that. Now, 
what happened is you allow the officials allowed a physicality to be established early, which in return disrupted Kentucky for 40 minutes. Absolutely. Being able to put hands on and not be able to, to have freedom of movement on drives. But here's where you got to play through it. You got to be tough enough to play through that contact and get to the rim. As John Calipari says, you're not going to finish plays falling out of bounds. And Kentucky tried to do that a lot. They didn't have kind of the in their gut wanting to just go do it and make a play. Some guys shot away. Reed probably looked the worst that we've seen him yep, last definitely. night. A lot of guys did. Now you had that happening, and then you had South Carolina being very aggressive in traps, trapping some ball screens, things like that. When Kentucky did make shots, it was because Rob was in space and hitting some pull-up jumpers. Now, as good as Rob was early for a stretch, there were some plays in the second half where he missed some guys in situations. And Kentucky as a team was not good passing out of these traps and things. And overall, Jack, you had another game where defensive issues are defensive issues. I can live with certain things. The thing that's getting me with this team is the lack of discipline on that end of the floor. And nothing is going to improve until they play and stay solid and play more discipline. And we're going to get into some clips and stuff as we go throughout the show. But that is what is killing this team. When you drop, what is it now, 38, 40 spots in adjusted mm -hmm. D over the course of two games, it shows you how marginal that category is, that you can drop that far in two games. But it also is showing us that this team is going in the wrong direction at a crucial point in the season. And adding size has not made the defense better. So something's got to shift and something's got to change. And a lot of it is they don't stay disciplined somebody gambles and it puts them in a tough spot. Yeah. And Lamont Paris, if you listen to his post game um, after the, the their win, he said, we didn't really do anything offensively. We kind of have an, an identity. We are who we are offensively. We're no, we're not going to go score 90 in a game. We're not going to go nuclear from three. Although go figure the guy that shoots 22 and a half percent going into the game starts you know, four for four from three, you get some fluky stuff, but they didn't throw anything exotic at Kentucky to confuse them. They, he even said, I basically put all of my eggs in the defensive basket and said, we're going to shut them down on their offensive end and just kind of see how things played, played out. And unfortunately he unveiled the, the blueprint. He, he has shown the rest of the college basketball world that if you get them out of transition, if you get them into the half court, muck things up, disrupt them, bum rush them, get them really uncomfortable and force them back into their selfish me first habits where you kind of go back to that UNC Wilmington. Well, all right, I'm panicking. I, we, we're kind of in danger zone. I'm just going to go get mine. And then this guy's going to go get his. And then this guy's going to go get his. That's how you get seven assists in a game like this is a team that just had 24 the game before and you follow that up with, with, with seven in this one ball movement was terrible you got all of the bad uh-oh habits that we had seen at times and they've you know very quickly gotten out of we saw that for a full 40 minutes uh, and that's how you get 62 two points that's how you get seven assists on 25 made baskets that's how you shoot 40 percent from the field and, and, and only making four threes only attempting 13 threes it was if if you watch this tape moving forward if you're an opponent you have the blueprint you don't have to be bigger stronger tougher faster you just kind of got to try to muck stuff up for this offense and you could you could put together successful stretches. That's the scary part. That if the defense isn't looking any better and teams are kind of finding the secret sauce to slowing down this offense, you could see the path for this to unravel a little bit. And that's the scary part. You you we, you, you got to get it figured out. Got to. I, I don't know what that looks like, Sean. You're the coach. I'm not. But it's got to get figured out and and fast. Well, and that's the thing. Like. I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about the offense because I've seen the offense for 97, 98% of the season be okay. And I'm confident that offensively they will be fine. The defense though, continues to go the other direction. And that's where I'm talking. So yeah, 62 points didn't score enough to win the basketball game. 
But defensively, Jack, the issues just keep getting worse. And I'm talking lack of discipline in so many areas on that end of the floor. When it's a three or four point game and you're trying to make a run and then you put yourself in a bad spot and gamble. And, and you know, Daniel's got some some stuff here with some frames, I think. But and I'm not just picking on Rob. I can go throughout this entire game and find you where somebody's out of position. But in this one, this is a play where, you know, Trey stays a little long on the ball screen. And then Ugo ends up having to tag. And then there's a miscommunication miscommunication on the roll and replace. But Rob just completely leaves his man and tries to back tip someone. And they end up giving up a wide open three out of this trip. That's a four point game with 1344 to go in the second half. And it kind of from that point on started to swing South Carolina's way. The same thing happened in the Georgia game. Rob is in good position. He goes to gamble. We get a baseline drive. Ugo comes over, has great help, but then Aaron Bradshaw gets caught ball watching. But it starts with a gamble and not staying solid defensively. This is happening a ton with this team. And it's not just straight line drive after straight line drive. When And we were talking about three-point percentage with these guys. And teams, like, you know, Cal talking about last night, he expected one to get banked in and stuff. At some point, when it keeps happening, it's because of you. Not Cal. I'm talking about Kentucky. Like, if teams that don't shoot the three well just come out and start hitting threes against you, it's not always just luck. At some point, you got to look at yourself and say, what are we doing? I don't care if they are 22 23% three-point shooters. If you let them stand wide open, they're going to become 33 34 35% three-point shooters. And they're going to make shots. They play college basketball at the D1 level for a reason. Kentucky is not locked in on the defensive end, Jack. And I'm telling you, they're not going to get better in that area until it's defending as a unit Four guys can't be solid, and one guy kind of just go and do his own thing. And I'm not just claiming – I'm not just hammering on Rob. This is an issue throughout the roster, but I find Rob doing the same thing over and over again a lot of times, just scrambling out of control and not being disciplined, and that has to get fixed. So what does that look like, though? Because I, I know Cal – earlier in the season when it was kind of cute. Oh yeah, we're a little behind defensively. We're going to do some lane slides. We're going to do some wall sits. It it was kind of a thing early, but we had never reached this panic territory to know that like, okay, we really got to hunker down here or we could be in danger zone long-term. So how, what is a fix for that defensively? Because again, we had said ad nauseum on the show it did kind of appear to be a concentration and focus and discipline thing. How much of it is, is physical and technical. I, I'm still not a hundred percent certain because we have seen them put together stretches of very solid, high level defensive play, but I, I don't know. It, it's, it's like they're, they're teetering that fine line of whether it's a physical deficiency on that end or if it's just as simple as staying locked in in you know a panic setting because it did feel like when the offense dug itself a hole last night it felt like you were leaning on the defense okay well if we could just come up with one kill if we could get three stops what happens long term in this game because you know you we were talking about it in our own private text that they had started to put together singles on the offensive end you started to see some okay well you know they won this segment well they won another segment they got it down to two on Trey Mitchell free throws it kind of felt like things were starting to teeter and then you blink and it's a 13 point game three minutes later I I just I don't know what that next step looks like Sean and, and as a coach what what is there to do besides just saying hey if you don't lock in right now you're gonna get your ass kicked like, is, is that as simple as it is? It, it's not lane slides and it's not wall sits. Wall sits and lane slides aren't going to fix what is here. And it's just a lack of discipline, and a lot of it is mental discipline. It's like I, I'm, I'm the clip I showed you a minute ago with, with Georgia. That's where Georgia's run at the end of the game started. A baseline underneath, which has been a problem now, that they're not defending out of bound, baseline out-of-bounds sets. But then if Daniel puts it back up, um, the Georgia one. So that, that's an offensive play that I'm going to talk about in a minute. So there's the Georgia one. So Rob gambles. But first of all, look where Rob's eyes are in the first frame. 
Rob, Rob's already showing the back of his head. And I'm I, like I said, I'm not hammering on Rob because I'm going to get to the other side. So the last clip there, and I don't think we can zoom in. Rob's getting beat baseline. Ugo comes over and helps. But look at Aaron Bradshaw. Look where his eyes are. Dead straight on the drive. And then what happens is that's a baseline pass fired to a shooter. And they hit a three. And that's the the mental things I'm talking about in the lack of discipline. This team gets caught ball watching a ton. And then one guy goes and tries to do his own thing or there's no communication, no talking on some screens. Like it's, it's, it's something Kentucky's issues are more because of them than it is because of these teams just running good stuff. Yes. These teams do run good actions, but Kentucky scouts Jack. And you can't tell me that Kentucky doesn't know some sets and some looks that these teams want to get to, but there's it. All it starts with is one guy breaking down. If four guys are solid and one guy breaks down, Kentucky's defensive rotations are actually worse than the initial on-ball defense. It's the mm -hmm. rotations and the help that's so bad right now, too. And while we're talking about some of those deficiencies, um, what what the hell do you do about the guarding the inbounds? And and the I mean, I think that's five in the last two games uh, of just getting lost in that area and and giving up gimmies. I mean, I. What, what do you do? Well, I think you got to turn on the tape and look at how you're doing it because whatever you're doing is not working. And and teams have found some weakness. And I, I need to dive into those and, and look at all those individual baseline underneaths and see. But for as much criticism as people have given Cal over the years of not running baseline out of bounds sets, this year he has. But Kentucky's also given up a ton too. Which you think – you'd on think – the other on end paper, way. yeah, you'd think if they're running it, there's a, an equal response to having to guard it. Like, I, I we've talked about the how creative they've been running it on their end. So, it, it, it for, for them to be as bad as they are defending it, 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 it does kind of blow my mind. And, and here's the other thing, too, and a, a lot of people getting caught up in you know, Cal never going to a zone and Cal just sitting in man to man and. And here's the thing. So principles are principles. I mean, you got to see bossy man zone. You got to see it, man. It, it doesn't matter. And Kentucky right now has a hard enough time seeing ball and man in man to man defense. So you're probably, if you do go zone, you're probably going to give up quite a few open looks, but they are giving open up open looks in man right now too. So do I think Cal's ever going to throw some zone in there? I don't. Would I like to see it just to maybe switch some things up? I would just in games, even if it's just two or three possessions a game, just to throw something different out of a timeout, baseline underneath, just something just to kind of mix it up and, and throw a team off or just something that you haven't done. But this team is going to continue to score the basketball. Last night they had a lot of spacing issues. They did some things – that I hadn't seen them do this year. And then they missed some guys. And that was the clip that Daniel was putting up there. Uh, it's DJ. That ends up being that ends up being DJ trying to score with his left hand. But look where Trey Mitchell's at. Like, mm -hmm. you got to see it. And if Trey doesn't get that shot, then we've got a one more to Antonio Reeves to his left. And then Justin slides in spaces too. So then you're forcing an X out and a scramble. Kentucky didn't make the extra pass for themselves that they had been doing. So you can see there, there is no ball side help from Rob Dillingham's man. You do not leave the strong side at all. So the help's not coming from there, but you've got to see Trey and Trey is calling for the ball. Wants it. And Trey's going to see that extra pass to Antonio or Trey's going to put it on the floor and get somewhere and make a play. That happened a lot of times last night too, on the offensive end where you didn't defend anywhere near what you need to, but then you just didn't make anything easy on yourselves offensively because you just did not move the basketball. You didn't play through bumps. Your spacing was terrible, but when you did have spacing, you didn't take advantage of it and move the basketball. Looking at, uh, well, scrolling through Twitter, uh, UK is the 35th percentile nationally in, on baseline out of bounds at, at um, 0.875 points per position possession 14th percentile on sideline out of bounds play at 0.971 points per possession and 23rd percentile in uh after timeout half court uh defense 0.914 points per possession so 
it it's not just like a feel thing. It's not like we're watching this and going, damn, it does kind of feel like we're really struggling in those areas. No, the, the numbers are backing that up. They, they're, they have been really, really disappointing in that area. And um, I, I know this was a topic that we wanted to get to. Um, something's got to give here with the rotations. And I think it was cute and fun and exciting to talk about the possibility of adding all these guys. And now you have 11 legitimate scholarship players who can go out there and make plays 10. I mean, 11, including Jordan Burks, uh, 10 um, w- without him, but some something's got to give. Cause I thought for the first time we got a little panicky uh, in, in terms of just trying to throw stuff in there and make things work. It was like that you're, you're it's like you're at a, a baseball game and they have the stupid like baseball cap game where they have put the little, sh- the little ball underneath the baseball cap and they shuffle them around like that. It, it felt like we were watching that in real time where it was just like, okay, well this five man group isn't working. So let's switch this out. Let's do this. And you, it never felt like we got any continuity with any of them. And when you have a group that hasn't played together at all, the way that this 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 team is constructed right now with Z's return, like I feel like you do kind of have to play through some of that. And, and uh, J. Kyle Mann, be, be, uh, friend of the show, good good buddy of mine, um, he shared this stat, and it's very very troubling. Minute distribution for Kentucky's lineups last night: lineups that played at least three minutes together, two. At least two minutes together, nine. At least one minute together, 19. So there were 17 different lineup combinations that played between one and three minutes together. So when you go back to our last episode and I was talking about what concerns me most, what was it? I can't remember how I worded it exactly, but I was talking about what happens with this rotation, where it goes. You've added another guy to it. But when you see those numbers in minute distributions and different lineups, you're not getting a rhythm offensively. You're also putting a whole lot of dudes out there defensively that are just getting in situations and you're having breakdowns. So when I see that, I see why some of the stuff was so off last night, especially some of the baseline out of bounds. Like the one where Rob, it, it appears that there was a switch and then he just bells on off the back screen and left a guy wide open at the rim. That's miscommunication. And you got to be in sync too. Like you can practice and practice and practice and talk and talk and talk. I've been texting the group and I was telling you all yesterday that, and I know a lot of people are, are like, well, why don't you just play nine or 10 guys when it gets down the NCAA tournament? If that's who you are, do it. But over the course of John Calipari's career, that is not who he is. You can go back to the 38-1 and one team and see the minutes change when it mattered. I mean, Dakari Johnson, I believe, in that Final Four game, played under 10 minutes, and he played mm-hmm. 25 in the national championship the year before. I know Willie was out, but that was a guy that played a lot of minutes throughout the season. I remember sitting there in 2019 – and John Calipari riding Reed Travis on a bad knee, 44 minutes in an overtime loss to Auburn. I remember Nick Richards going in and making a mistake. Boom, right back out. EJ Montgomery wasn't good enough. Boom, right back out. Jamal Baker fouled a three-point shooter. Boom, out. I and can't then it became, play you. And then it became a five- to six-guy game for a team that hadn't done that over the course of the season. Now, you're doing it. You're playing a lot of guys. But I'm telling you all, at some point, this is going to shift. And the thing is, is if it's going to shift, I don't want to see it shift in game 36, 37, 38. So because then you're it, it's it's an out of rhythm thing. You're doing something different that you've not done over the course of four to four and a half months. This rotation will shrink. There has to be some changes made to the starting lineup. I'm just going to say it. You got to stop trying to break through somebody with Justin Edwards. It's either going to happen or it's not. I've seen 20 games or right at it. I just don't see the breakthrough that Cal is seeing. He may, he might break through at some point and help Jack, but you got to get off to good starts in games. And at this point, you got to find out who the, who is your best five, who's your best six, who's your best seven. 
continuing to run out there, and we've seen this. It, he's not. I just don't feel like he's a part of it. And I just think that it's a it's a fine line. I get you don't want to break confidence, but at some point, those guys in the locker room too, I think, know it. And it's just it's a hard thing to navigate. And I'm glad it's not my job to do it. But I just feel like that when you lose the way that you lost last night, you're kind of justified in making some changes. I told you all when Kentucky lost to St. Peter's two years ago in the NCAA tournament, Cal had every right to just blow the roster up and start all over with whatever, but he chose not to and decided to run it back. When you lose like you did last night, it's an eye-opener, and I think you got to look at every single thing and think, how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? Because there are some things that I think need to be changed. You got to get out. You got to have your best five on the floor to start games in the NCAA tournament. You have to. If he's not a part of that, then you're wasting opportunities to start games there, in my opinion. I mean, and and to I mean, admittedly, to our credit, we have been riding the Justin Edwards wave. I mean, for for weeks now. When it look, we we can all see what we're seeing. Like we we know that Justin has not lived up to. And that was, I thought about this before the show started. That's the troubling part of trying to set expectations and temper them. And while also being fair, because when the number one pick, he's look at all, all these mock drafts coming out. and, And I come on this show and I say, guys, I'm here to tell you he ain't a number one pick a guy who tells you to your face, I am not a Batman. I'm a Robin. That mindset, the I'm cool being kind of in the background, the playing in the shadows being the, you know, those guys aren't number one picks. And I always said, well, that doesn't mean he can't be a lottery pick because there are, you know, a a ton of guys who can play that role in the NBA, but watching a, a significant sample size of him across grassroots, high school, all American events. He has never been that guy. And I, of his struggles, it did feel like something would have to give with him in this lineup. You hope that he could break through because physically he has the tools, but did he have the mental makeup to have that opportunity to break through? And that was the one thing, my one sticking point where we, we talked about it. There is going to be a fork in the road road coming up with Justin Edwards where he could either go this way and explode as the you know lottery. But I, I still don't think he'll ever get to that top three that some draft analysts were saying, but at least becoming that, okay, well, there's the lottery vision there. Or is he going to go down that other path of we can't play you, dude? And we've been hanging on as patient and long as possible, and we – have My, hope have hoped, but 23 minute that's a that's 23 empty minutes last night. I mean, just calling a spade a spade. That was 23 empty calorie minutes that 14 for Reed Shepard, 10 for Ugo, 10 for Big Z, 21 for Aaron Bradshaw. Like I get some guys had foul troubles and it was it was situational, but big picture, man, you can't go 0 for one, two rebounds, one turnover, two fouls in 23 minutes, and that's your that's your night. You can't do it. And, and my thing is this, and I'm probably not going to make some people happy over there with with the last five minutes, but and probably not here either. You just can't continue to have the leash there, and then you just pull it back on Reed because he just has like one. I mean, it was Reed wasn't good, right? But it was basically like an I just well can't trust you here tonight in this game in this moment. So we and Justin was fifth. Like I said, I picked on Rob a moment ago defensively. I picked on Aaron. Like this isn't just a one guy thing. But with Justin, he played the fifth most minutes last night. And I just don't I just don't see it. Like I just I'm not and the only guy that was a true zero. Like I mean, if you are going to play somebody like Justin, you're at least leaning on him on the defensive end and say, well, our biggest issue right now is defense. I'm just hoping that the six, seven guy with a long wingspan and the physical tools to break through on that end, I I'm banking on him to have the breakthrough moment on that end. And maybe it leads to, you know, defense turning to offense. Maybe like m- maybe that's the vision for Cal for, for watching him break through. And Cal had the comments last night about Justin 
saying that, you know, we got to kind of, we have to kind of keep riding him. And I just, I, we, we're at the fork in the road as, as we talked about, we've been rooting for him. We've been longer than anybody else out there. I mean, 50% of the, shoot more than that of the fan base had, had would have given up on him a month ago but we've been hanging on we've been remaining patient because you do see on paper what he should look like but if he's not going to turn the on paper into on court production you got as you said you got to ride the, 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 the five best players on the team and right now Justin probably isn't even in the top eight or nine of the best and, players on the team. and all I'm saying here with this is I'm not saying don't play Justin. Just change something. Just see what happens. See if he responds to it. Like, I get it. You're afraid of breaking him. But continuing to roll him out there and doing it the way that he's doing it, I mean, it's it's not working. So bring him off the bench. Try something different. Maybe let him watch for a four-minute segment, and then you stick him in there after the first media timeout, and you see how – just see how he responds. Just change it up one time and just see if there's something there that maybe he's maybe he feels more comfortable coming off the bench. I, I don't know, but he took one shot, hit a couple of free throws. And this is not just – I'm not just picking on individual guys here because this was a total team collapse last night Absolutely. in Columbia. But I'm just talking about things that I, I, I'm afraid are going to continue, and that's what I was getting to. When it gets into the SEC tournament, NCAA tournament, is this what Cal's going to do? It's not. Cal's going to play. He's going to settle in, and it's going to be the guys that he trusts most. I don't know where those guys are or who those guys are at the moment, but once you turn this calendar to February, that's what you got to figure out in the final month of the regular season is where, who is my winning basketball moment? Who is on the floor when it's winning time? especially in a game where things aren't going well, but you're down four with under 14, 13 to play, you still got a chance to win that basketball game. It doesn't snowball and turn into what it did last night. That should have been a statement that you shot the ball well from three. We have played horrible offensively, but we're going to lock in here in the final 13 and we're going to beat you on your home floor when you've given us your best effort. Instead, it snowballed. Now, Kentucky went on the road to Florida with Darren Fox and Malik Monk that year and got embarrassed. This isn't an uncommon thing. Am I worried about Kentucky and how good they can be? No. Agreed. Am I worried about something like this happening and starting to become a trend every two or three games, four games? Yes. Because I got to see this team start to defend better. I was I was okay with it when it was 58th, 56th, 60th in adjusted D because I saw a path to get – to where the number I wanted. Now that it's like 100. 90, 98. Yeah, 98. Now I keep telling myself, you're a game or two away from being 120. And there's no team outside the top 100 that's going to make a run in the Final Four in adjusted D. I'm sorry. It's just there's too big of a, a gap there in offense and defense. Like I just, like I said, thing that makes this show so good is I think we're honest and I think we call it how it is. Is John Calipari doing an excellent job with this team? 100%. Has this team been fun to watch, and are they one of the best teams in college basketball? Yes. Can they beat any team in the country and win a national championship? Yes. Can they lose a clunker in the second round? Yes. That's what I'm trying to say. So you got to do whatever it takes to avoid the, the latter part of that. And you got to get it to where you you you're comfortable being able because they're gonna they're gonna have to win a game like that again at some point down the stretch, Jack. There's gonna be a game where they're gonna have to win it in the same manner. So they've lost a shootout, and then last night they couldn't score, and then defense just continued to trend the wrong direction. I mean, it was the three point percentage too. Like South Carolina shot what forty percent from the floor, but it was like fifty percent from three. Mm -hmm. It's another one area of the game that was just killing Kentucky. And the Kentucky, I think, was like 2 of 13 on layups in the first half. Like, what? <laughs> well, as we are stressed out about this team and, and, and figuring out what the next steps are, 
you shouldn't have to feel stressed during your buying ticket experience to your next big event. Now isn't the time for guesswork with killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seed and their best best price guaranteed game time does all the hard work for you game time has deals on tickets right up to the start of the event and even an hour after it starts it's the place to find last minute seats find exclusive flash deals and sponsor deals on tickets for football basketball baseball concerts comedy theater and more game time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase see the view from your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive all in prices show your total up front so you know you're getting a great deal before you check out buy tickets in seconds with two taps and the game time guarantee means that you will always get the best price if you find tickets in the same section row for less game time will credit you uh 110% of the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code KSR for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code KSR for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Sean, uh, I'm very excited for this next. We, we, we're kind of going back and forth of, okay, is this the right time to do this? And I think it is the perfect time because we have none other than John Rossi coming up on our show. Um, you know, right when the media takeoff was happening with Kentucky and everybody buying into its national championship uh, takes, the rug kind of got pulled out from them a little bit. And now we get to hear from the horse's mouth immediately after the fact to just know kind of what the national vibe is with this team. So we're excited for John Rossine to come on to kind of break things down for us. Conference college basketball season is tipped off. Plus you have the NBA and NFL joined FanDuel America's number one sports book right now. New customers get 150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet, that's 150 bucks in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use. And there are so many different ways to bet like live uh, same game parlays, find bets in the new explore tab make a parlay in the parlay hub the best way to find popular parlays and more so visit fanduel.com slash pilgrim and make your first bet a layup fanduel official partner of the nfl uh 21 and older and present in kentucky first online real money wager only ten dollar first deposit required bonus issued as non withdrawable bonus bets which expire seven days after receipt restrictions apply see terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com gambling problem call 1-800-GAMBLER now we are set to bring on our guy john rossine to figure out what is going on with this kentucky basketball and our in his thoughts on kentucky's national championship hopes let's go on and uh and, and hit that. It's going to be a blast. As promised, very excited to welcome to the show CBS Sports College Basketball Insider John Rossi. And today's guest feature is thanks to our friends at FanDuel Sportsbook. John, I know uh, F FanDuel, I, I love your, your FanDuel segment. So we, we're glad to kind of have bring this partnership to life. We've had you on our show in the past, just kind of in one-off shows to get your expertise. And now we can do it as, as official FanDuel partners. So uh, it, it's a good day to be uh, with, with FanDuel. Always great to be with you guys. So uh, I, we were kind of going back and forth. We had this scheduled before, obviously, the nightmare that was last night in, in Columbia. Uh, so we kind of had these hopes and dreams of you talking about this team's national championships hopes uh, and, you know, what a Final Four run would look like. Uh, and, you know, things got a little derailed last night. I guess from a national perspective, what? how do you kind of soak in a, a game like that where things had been rolling and then a complete one-off disaster happens how, how do you evaluate that well the first thing that i would do is just tell kentucky fans to relax one game does not make a season and also a reminder that the ncaa tournament or the sec tournament will not be played in a road type setting but first let's give some credit to south carolina this is a team that did not have miles studi one of its key impact transfers available due to an injury, and it was still able to win in convincing fashion. And that's a credit to Lamont Paris and what he's doing at South Carolina. And, you know, I, I've known Lamont Paris since he was an assistant under Bo Ryan at Wisconsin. Definitely not a reference that Kentucky fans want to hear today after a loss Yikes. to South Carolina. But when Lamont Paris got the South Carolina job, he told me that he knew he was not going to be able to recruit as well as Alabama, Kentucky, Tennessee, and he was going to have to win with a comparable style to what he did at Wisconsin. And you look at the ball security last night, only nine turnovers. You look at how little South Carolina fouled, 
try not to not put Kentucky in the bonus too early. These are similar attributes that we saw from Bo Ryan's teams at Wisconsin. And also, guys, you know, I think that the transfer portal now has allowed traditional conferences, obviously, the or traditional teams, traditional programs, the opportunity to build either with freshmen or transfers. But if you're not a program that's going to regularly get a large volume of impact freshmen at a high level and have those freshmen stay in the same program for a number of years. You have to be creative with how you build your roster. BJ Mack, fifth year player. Talon Cooper, fifth year player. Michi Johnson, fourth year player. So there's a lot of collective experience on that South Carolina roster. And I think that has a lot to do with the victory against Kentucky. John, there was a lot of talk. Obviously, we saw with our own two eyes the defensive struggles that this Kentucky yeah. team had had. And but we the mindset had just been, well, we're just outscoring guys, and it's tough to see anybody slow down the just historic pace that this offense uh, had been putting together. And then Lamont Paris puts together the the blueprint. I mean, it's 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 out there now. Muck things up, get physical yeah. with this group. Uh, do you expect this to kind of be the, the 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 theme moving forward? Teams just using this game plan and saying, "Well, if we can we can get physical with these young 18, 19 year olds, you know, you you got a shot to beat beat this Kentucky team." Well, I think we saw last night the blueprint of the type of team that could slow down Kentucky in the NCAA tournament if Kentucky were to go up against a team like a Wisconsin or we saw South Carolina or a team that's really really tough defensively in the half court, as you mentioned. So. This is only January, so I don't want Kentucky fans to feel too, obviously, alarmed today. But I would say if you had to sum up Kentucky right now, they have maybe the highest ceiling in college basketball because of the talent that they have, both on the perimeter and also up front. But we also don't know if Kentucky can win and beat an opponent in multiple ways. Kentucky offensively is good enough to outscore anybody in college basketball. But the question is this. If Kentucky were to get into a situation where it would have to win a game in the mud, is this group of Wildcats capable? Right now, that's to be determined. And they've added Big Z, and we, we know that that coming out party was, was fun to watch against Georgia. But, John, this is a team that they've had to add guys at different points throughout the season. And right now they're without a do the arrow. And last night we saw some, some lineup combinations and a lot of mixing and matching some of it didn't make sense. A lot of substitutions here and there. How much do you think that is putting some pressure on John Calipari to kind of figure out where he wants to go with all this talent that he has? A lot of pressure. And I think, you know, the most underrated thing in college basketball, everybody loves to have, you know, great depth and so on and so forth. But the most underrated thing when you look at really good teams is having the right rhythm and the right chemistry. And that doesn't necessarily mean being the deepest team in the sport. I remember I was at a Notre Dame practice a couple of years ago and Mike Bray told me that depth is really overrated in games. It's underrated in practice. And one of the things that I really liked early in the season with Kentucky, with Trey Mitchell as a small ball five, was it allowed Kentucky to have Justin Edwards slide down a little bit. It allowed Kentucky, and I know he hasn't played in about a month, to have a Du Thierro in a blend type role where he could have a great impact on a team by not demanding shots. And I think if you look at it from a coaching perspective, the number one thing you think about, especially at a place like Kentucky, is shot distribution and whose hands the ball's in. You never have to worry about that with a player like a Thierro. So you take him out of the equation now, and all of a sudden you start to wonder, how are all these people getting shots? And now, because you have the additional 15 fouls with Aaron Bradshaw, with Big Z, with Ugana Onyenso, you're pretty much eliminating any ideas of playing Trey Mitchell again as a small ball five, even in spurts, because if he's a small ball five, you got three seven-footers sitting on the bench. So it's going to take a little bit of time for John Calipari to find the secret sauce. Does Kentucky have tremendous talent? Absolutely. Are they loaded with 15 fouls at the 5, 20, if you want to count Trey Mitchell as a center? Absolutely. And in an NCAA tournament setting, if you take on Purdue and you have to guard Zach Eady, that's valuable. If you take on Arizona and you have to guard Umar Ballo, that's valuable. If you take on Connecticut and you have to guard Donovan Klingon, that's valuable. But the rhythm and the chemistry that I saw early in the year with Kentucky is, again, I think something that Kentucky is striving to get back. 
You know Reeves is playing major minutes. You know Wagner, Dillingham, Shepard is playing ma- are playing major minutes. We have to see what happens when Aduciero comes back. But Kentucky's got a lot of pieces right now. But the Rubik's cube does not feel like it's a line. So there, there are Kentucky fans right now that kind of feel like the odd man out. Think the way things are trending is Justin Edwards. Yeah. You know how how do you envision John Calipari by March? I mean, it's a seven eight man rotation. I mean, to a science. Who who do you think you you name some of those guys? Who do you think make up the the seven or eight man rotation? And do you think Justin ends up finding, unfortunately, on the uh, the, the outside looking in? Well, let's get to Justin Edwards first because I think you know we spoke in the off season and I had done the Iverson Classic when Justin Edwards was the best player in the game and coming into this season, I firmly believed that the two best freshmen coming into the year in terms of guys that had a chance to be all Americans this season were Justin Edwards and Isaiah Collier at USC. And you can make the case that the Trojans are one of the biggest disappointments in the country this year. I felt watching Justin Edwards before he got to Kentucky, that he would be at his best as a wing with another versatile foreman around him and a guy who could blend like a Ducierro. Now you're seeing a scenario where Kentucky, because I think also of the emergence of both Dillingham and Shepard, wants to make sure that it's finding ample time for all of its perimeter players. So there is definitely a situation now, especially when a Duthiero comes back, and he's somebody, guys, who I firmly believe defensively on the offensive glass has a role. And I've talked to Kentucky staff about this. I think I mentioned it to you guys. He is not this player. But I think he can fill a role at a bigger size comparable to this player. He can do, in my opinion, some of the things that Dominique Hawkins used to do about 10 years ago for Kentucky in terms of putting a player on the floor that can have a great impact without demanding a shot. I think back to that 2014 Elite Eight game against Michigan when Nick Stauskas was cooking in the first half and John Calipari made a tremendous adjustment by playing Hawkins in the second half giving him no help side responsibilities. If memory serves correct, this is 10 years ago now. Stauskas got 14 in the first half. I think he finished with 20 because of Hawkins. Sometimes, you know, when we think about roster construction, there is so much focus on what we want to get, you know, the most talented players. Fit and role understanding is such an important thing of what makes a successful team. Adu Thiero is part of that equation, and if he is going to be part of that equation – Somebody else isn't going to be playing. So you look at the makeup now of Kentucky's team. Antonio Reeves, I know he didn't have a great shooting night last night, is playing like somebody who's having an All-American type season. He's going to play. DJ Wagner in the last month hasn't just been good. He's been efficient as well. He's playing a lot of minutes. And we've already mentioned Dillingham and Shepard. It's going to be a little bit of a piece of clay here that John Calipari has to get just right. But we have a lot of time. Again, guys, this is only January. And, and John Jack mentioned the defensive issues there when we when we opened this. This has kind of been a trend, though, for the last three or four years with Kentucky, where they've not been in that top 20, top 25 in adjusted defense efficiency. Right now they're 98th, mm-hmm. and adding size hasn't improved on that end of the floor. Do you do you think that this team has the pieces to, to trend back in the right direction on that end of the floor? I think they do, and I think, you know, we've seen when Kentucky has played a little bit bigger and has had the rim protection at the front of the rim with guys like Ugano and Yenso or at times Aaron Bradshaw, it has been a team that can protect the front of the rim defensively and be better on that side of the floor. The ironic thing to me is this. When I think back to the best teams that John Calipari has coached at Memphis at Kentucky, especially in 2015 and 2012, the backbone wasn't great offense. It was elite defense. Willie Cauley-Stein, Anthony Davis, Michael Kidd-Gilchrist. In a lot of ways, this team's success and the way it's had success thus far, putting up 90-plus on a team like Mississippi State, is the polar opposite of the successful teams that John Calipari has had, not just at Kentucky, but throughout his coaching career. John, I guess let's let's talk big picture. You know, while we're talking about what this Kentucky team could look like at the end of the day, because uh, just a couple of days back, you put out your final four picks. Uh, as of, as of today, Kentucky was included in that mix uh, alongside UConn, UNC, and, and Purdue. Uh, has that changed at all? Well, what are your 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 latest thoughts? I'm not going to back off. 
because of one game where, and again, we have to, sometimes we don't do this when we evaluate. Sometimes you just don't give the other team credit. Lamont Paris, I think, is the SEC coach of the year right now. Agreed. Lamont Paris is in a situation where he has taken a team that, again, was irrelevant a year ago in his first season. He's installed a system. Again, he has them with a low turnover point guard in Talon Cooper, or I think you guys would agree, was one of the more under-the-radar portal guests Ooh. in college basketball this year. And they're playing without Miles Studi. South Carolina, to me, is a good team. They're going to be an NCAA tournament team. So let's give South Carolina credit. I'm not backing off of Kentucky on a neutral court because of that. I'm not backing off on Kentucky because Kentucky lost a hard-fought game against the Texas A&M team at home in overtime that needed a victory desperately. But I do think in the next six weeks or so, a rotation has to be set, and we have to find out, again, is this team going to be able to win a game defensively in the mud? And look, I never want to overlook a game because Kentucky's got Arkansas this weekend. And there's obviously a lot of things in between Kentucky's game at Tennessee. But on February 3rd, when Kentucky gets a look at Tennessee, who I think we would all agree is the team to beat right now in the SEC, we're going to know a lot about this team. Because, you know, when you think about Tennessee and you think about the physicality that they have, you've got Jonas Adu, who's having, in my opinion, you know, a breakout season up front. We also have great size off the bench and physicality with Tobey Awaka and Jermai Meshack. Kentucky is going to be uncomfortable playing Tennessee. How do they respond in that game to me will be a true barometer of how Kentucky is going to look when it gets into the NCAA tournament and takes on a team that's older, bigger, stronger, and more physical. That's a good point, too, about Tennessee. And one more team I want to ask you about on Kentucky's schedule. Gonzaga comes to Rupp Arena here Mm -hmm. in a few weeks, John, and that's a team that doesn't have a quad one win as it stands. So, Kentucky's going to be facing a desperate team that night. Like, how, how do you view a team like that at this point in the season, and how big is that game in a few well, weeks? Well, it's ironic you said that. I just found out I'm going out to do uh, sidelines for Gonzaga's game right before they play Kentucky on Ooh. February the 7th against Portland, you know, because obviously Gonzaga is going to play Kentucky on February 10th on CBS to get a look at the Zags. But I think when you look at Gonzaga now, and this hasn't been pronounced, I think, nationally because Gonzaga hasn't been on – the national, I think, you know, radar that they normally are because they're not having the season that they normally do. But Ryan Nemhard, the transfer from Creighton, is in the middle of an epic stretch of ball security. In Ryan Nemhard's last three games, he has 25 assists and zero turnovers. Guys, I've been doing this a long time. I have seen Kevin Pangos, Ryan Archie Diacono, point guards of that ilk, go through and have a stretch where they've had 20 to 2. 21 to 1. I've never seen somebody go through a stretch where they have 25 assists and zero turnovers. Gonzaga also has, you know, players up front that have been through the gamut. Anton Watson had a great game earlier this year against UCLA. He's become more of a factor. Graham Ike is a piece from Wyoming. Braden Huff, who redshirted last year, is a piece. Gonzaga doesn't have what it had. And I think you would say it's probably the Gonzaga team with the lowest ceiling since the 2016 team that needed to win the WCC tournament to make the NCAA tournament. But this is going to be a, obviously a massive game at Rupp arena on February the 10th, not just because, you know, it's a big opportunity for Gonzaga. If Gonzaga wants to be in at large team, it's also, you know, Gonzaga coming to Rupp arena to play a regular season game against Kentucky. That's pretty cool. Hey, and John, let's look at some of these you know, national title odds from from FanDuel. Uh, Purdue at plus 750, UConn plus 1,000, Houston plus 1,000, 1,100 uh, for, for Arizona, North Carolina, 1,500, Tennessee, 1,500. I, there's kind of this mindset going into the year, early on in the year, that there weren't any yeah. truly elite juggernauts, unbeatable teams yeah. that you go, well, that's the, that, you know. But I feel like there is kind of a, a grouping of yeah. teams now that you can kind of see the path there. Uh, just talk about some of those other teams. I know you have your final four picks, but uh, some some of those other top-end contenders that you think really could, you know, make a run for, for a national championship. I mean, last year, we think about the final four, okay? Florida Atlantic's in an 8-9 game. San Diego State's a five seed. Miami's a five seed. UConn's a four seed. We did not have a one, two, or three seed in the final four. If you're asking me, could that happen again? I would say absolutely. 
I would say without hesitation that could happen again. It remains to be seen, but I still think there's a couple of teams that are at the top, Purdue, Connecticut. I would also put, you know, North Carolina with the way they're playing, and I would put Kentucky in that mix as well. But there's a lot of basketball left to be played to find out if there's anybody else other than that tier that could win six games in the NCAA tournament. There's a lot of teams that can win four. I think there's only a handful that can win six as of right now. And, and is there a team that you look at that maybe you think one that could give Kentucky some trouble? There's always that one or two teams that Kentucky fans kind of don't want to see. We've seen them beat North Carolina on a neutral floor, but who's that one team if you had to pick that you think could ca cause Kentucky a lot of problems? Great defensive teams right now that would slow the tempo and make the game a straight-up fist fight. If you're asking me off the top of my head, the team that Kentucky would not want to see would be Houston as of today. Hmm. Uh, what about a, a dark horse, uh, a team that you know probably isn't getting enough love right now that you think could be one of those teams we talked about that you know four or five range that ends up being there in, in, in Phoenix? In the Final Four. Making a run. Wow, that is a, that is some question right now from for January. Because here's the thing, I don't think we have as many capable teams as we've had in the past. Final four run as a four or a five seed. It's hard to trust anybody in the Big Ten after the past couple of years. Agreed. We, we can. <laughs> uh, I'm going to need a lot, a little more time on that. If we, we can do this again in February, I think that would be better because I would need a little bit more time on that. I mean, if you're maybe, you know, it's not, again, Duke wouldn't be obviously a team that you would think, but I'm thinking in terms of the four or five line right now. I mean, I think Illinois, you could probably put in that category with Terrence Shannon Jr. back. I think Illinois seed might be a little bit higher than that. Wisconsin has played, you know, I think better offensive basketball than they have ever under Greg Gard, but Guys, I am just very, you know, tepid to put a lot of stock in any team from the Big Ten because in the last three NCAA tournaments, the Big Ten has had 26 teams reach the field. Not one has reached the Final Four and only one has reached the Elite Eight. So it's up to a lot of stock in the Big Ten. But give me another month and we'll revisit that question. Looking forward to it. Uh, let's we'll start wrapping up here um, for for Kentucky fans. Talk them off the. I know we 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 talk. You know, don't buy too much into one game. But what is the 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 future of this team? What what is the path for them to kind of get back into the you know fe the feel goods for uh, Kentucky fans and not not want to walk off the ledge? Look, uh, if you remember when we spoke, I believe before the season, I talked about how the Kentucky recruiting class that John Calipari assembled reminded me of the 13-14 team. This team is on a better trajectory than the 13-14 team because if you remember, that team really didn't show, I think, tangible evidence that it could play well in the NCAA tournament or go far in the NCAA tournament until it took Florida to the wire in the SEC tournament title game. The rest is history. They went to the national title game. John Calipari's teams always get better over the course of a season. That's another thing to keep in mind. And another thing, guys, is, you know, there was so much chatter in the offseason about how the offense was archaic and they didn't score enough. They weren't innovative enough. And now you've got a team that's scoring the ball, again, as well as any in college basketball. So that whole narrative has shifted. And you've got a team now, again, I think of all things are equal on a neutral court, may not be the most consistent, may not be able to win in as many ways as some of the other elite teams in college basketball, but may have the highest ceiling in the sport. And, and we know that John Calipari teams, continue, they start playing really good basketball late February going into yes, March. So, always happens. And, and when I was talking about defensive efficiency a moment ago, and I've made this point to Jack multiple times, it's not as much the overall number that I'm looking at as much as it is how are they defending in like those final 10 games entering the NCAA tournament. Sure. Yeah. And, and look, I mean, Cal's going to have to figure out too what he's going to want to do in terms of the usage of minutes at the four and the five. Obviously, to be better defensively, you're going to probably want to play Trey Mitchell and a big. But, you know, some of the other bigs minutes, it's not going to be Aaron Bradshaw's, whether it's Big Z or Yugan on Yenso, could be sacrificed in an effort to get your best players more minutes. And this is, I think, the thing to keep in mind. Having a tighter rotation is not a bad thing. And I'm going to go back again to another NCAA tournament run. This is now seven years ago. If you remember when Oregon went to the Final Four in 2017, 
Oregon lost one of its better bigs, Chris Boucher, right before the NCAA tournament to a season-ending injury. That allowed Jordan Bell, if you remember, to become one of the breakout stars of the NCAA tournament because he had a higher usage. He could play through mistakes. He could take more chances. Oregon doesn't get to a Final Four without Jordan Bell. And again, because sometimes you have it in your head that you can play with a reckless abandon, and if you make a mistake, you're not coming out of the game, that goes a long way. John, last thing I, I have for you, we'll get you out of here. Do you have a photo, photographic memory? If I read something once, yeah, I can retain it. It, it, it. it blows my mind every time we talk, your ability to nitpick for every team in college basketball, some random historical data, fact, analytic. Uh, it's It blows my mind. You're, you're, that, that's why you're the best in the game, man. It's it's always a blast talking to you and uh, your your ability to, to handpick things uh, across the entire basketball realm just it, – it never it never fails to amaze me. There's one way to sum it up, guys. Some people have hobbies. I watch college basketball. <laughs> Uh, John, this is a blast, man. Thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you for talking uh, Kentucky fans off the ledge. I think they needed it on this uh, w- Wednesday afternoon. You got it, guys. We sleep in May. <laughs> Appreciate you, John.